it's exactly like my 212. Oh. And it really flies. Really? I wouldn't fly it. I'd be scared of it all the way through. But he made this whole thing, gave it to me, all the details and everything. So it's one of my proudest possessions. It is beautiful. Yeah, it's just like my 212. They should get a little yeah. statuette and put you in there. He has. I mean, he's got tip-up glasses and everything else. Look, Pam and I are in there. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's amazing. Yeah, but isn't what Pam in the did. pilot sheet? Yeah. He <laughs> built that pretty much from scratch. Uh, What's the name of your dog? That's genius. Yeah. She's a good girl. She's cute. Yeah. So that's a picture of your father. Yeah, okay. So you got, oh, you're holding that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is my dad in World War I. And right here, 1909, this was his first car, Pope Hartford. That's uh, one of the original cars. And this is back in Stoughton, Massachusetts, about 18 miles south of Boston. And this is when he went into uh, World War I. And he flew the de Havilland Fours. Now, these are actually all built in America. The de Havilland, of course, was a British design. But the engines in here were Sturdivant engines built in Boston. They call them Liberty. They were 420 horsepower. And if you look at that engine, if you get a chance on the test bed today or out in a museum, look at the intricacy. In other words, we just, in my opinion, haven't developed very much the state of that. They had supercharged on just beautiful design. And they were 420 horsepower and uh, did pretty well. You notice there's two bays in this. But these were built in the United States, and those were the first bombers that actually dropped bombs. And my daddy said originally what they had, they had four bombs, probably 20, 25 pounds, even less than that. They cut them with a pair of scissors. And he said probably very, very soon they had little levers that uh, they could do it inside the cockpit. They, the fellow didn't have to reach out. And they had two on each side out on here originally. But this was the romantic position in the airplane. And all of the pilots and, the, and so alike had to take and uh, get in the uh, gunner's seat. And that was kind of an exotic picture everyone liked. And I'll show you a little more about the de Havilland now, here. Uh, let me ask this one. Oh, uh, sure. Forrest, uh, now he's got stripes on his, on his what's that? Oh, that was the time in service. And I think you got one every year you were actually on in combat service, yeah. What, what rank did yeah. he reach to? Uh, he reached, he was a captain when he came out, yeah. Was there a unit yeah. number or anything that you know about him? As far no, as I don't. Do? I got these originally from the military and they were in brown tone. And uh, all of these were pictures that he had and so on. This showed the British training aircraft. And this was kind of interesting over here because these were pictures that I really didn't, they were in brown tones. And I found them, as I say, I sent them in Kotec many years ago. And I got them from the military. And this shows, in other words, the big deal was the submarines, of course, in World War I. And this shows the single stack destroyer. A lot of these are British, you see. And then over here, the three stackers, this thing. For, and they used to put up smoke, you know, to take in uh, submarines. That was their main thing. And then they started to tow. See this the cable going up? And they would tow these balloons. And they had a fellow up here, apparently, with mirrors signaling down, in other words, telling the submarine here and there and so on. And, of course, they were dumping smoke and everything. But submarine was their mortal enemy. And this was, again, the... Uh, but these balloons did real well. Now, this is the Langley. Uh, the first airplane landed great all the way through, and this was actually the first picture. But the second one went through the barrier here. He came in a little too fast. But that was our first aircraft carrier. Did you ever uh, fly off a carrier? I, on an AT-6, just some transition out in Long Beach Harbor. I think maybe six takeoffs and landings with the hook, That's home, which is nothing. Eh? The one, one thing I was going to ask you, we didn't talk too much about you. At one time you were flying and you were pulling advertising and stuff. Banners? And oh, okay. I didn't finish that. Okay. That was on the Reedville racetrack in yeah. Boston. But you did that for a job? You got paid to do that? Yeah, I got paid to do it, yeah. And we had a Spartan, which was made up in Denver, high altitude biplane. And it had uh, about 220 horsepower right engine and almost the same engine that uh, Lindbergh flew the Atlantic with. And used Griffin all white shoe polish. And it was a windy day. It was marathon day, which would had to be in April. And I had flown one round in the morning. And I came back because I needed fuel. And I noticed oil dripping and so on on it. And the lineman said, oh, hell, she's an oil he dripping bastard and so on. It was always that way. So I took his word for it. And I went out the second time. And I got, it was a horrible wind blow on that day. It was probably 30 miles an hour, which was a lot for that. And I had the Reedville race track. There was nothing around it. In other words, houses and so on. And I noticed my oil pressure was going down. Didn't have an oil heater on it, temperature of the oil temperature. And it started to go down. I felt a little like that, but not really. It started to go down. And hell, I realized. And then I put the two and two together. I was leaking oil. So the only, I cut my band 
banner. I lost my banner. We never did find that. And then I landed on the Reedville racetrack, which normally without wind, it would have been kind of testy. But the wind, it practically, that was the landing speed, which was maybe 40 miles an hour. So I landed. No. Then I heard sirens coming. Of course, the police thought it was a joke I was landing on there. And then I explained what happened. Uh, to that. We never did find the banner and they tried to find it. But anyhow, the people at uh, Wiggins Airways that owned the airplane, they sent the crash truck out and we had it all done. This was probably four o'clock in the afternoon and I think by eight or nine o'clock we had it in the hangar putting it back together. Didn't hurt the engine, fortunately. And there was an interconnection between the two bottom cylinders where the oil went across. And there was a crack and it kept getting worse. Eh? And that's what happened on that one. Thing. Now, in, the, in those old days, when the, or early days of aviation, there was barnstormers and... Oh, yeah, you had a lot of them. They had, uh, well, that was past the peak because they had mostly had the Jennies, J4NDs. And, but the barnstormers still, but they couldn't, they were cheap airplanes. They couldn't afford expensive airplanes. But they were truly the barnstormers, and they'd operate in and out of fields. Remember, no brakes or anything else, and as long as they could land in the wind. But people, crowds would show up to those. Well, what they would do oftentimes, I remember... You'd take an airplane, you had a row of trees, and you'd stand it on a block so the tail was uh, up over, so you'd look on the highway and they would come running, they think it was a, an airplane crash. And then some of the other people, I remember all the barnstormers, the trick, somebody say, well, you know, I won't go until I get a foot in the ground, so they'd have a box of soil in a cigar box. So they pulled everything, and 25 cents, or, and then it got more expensive as the day went on. But they were the two barnstormers, they were all over. So yeah. I um, on the side, you would do the flying thing, pulling banners and stuff? As I did banner fun. towing, yes. Uh -huh. And then we had uh, what they called a screecher, which was a big Spartan monoplane. And they had uh, speakers in it, and the politicians and so on used to take and fly around. It was before the days of tape recorders and so on during Election Day, which wasn't very often, but once in a while. And then dusting also with the Eagle Rock. I was a pretty good duster, yeah. But you did crop dusting? Yeah, up in uh, Rista County in Maine, yeah. Is that one of those bi biplanes? It was a biplane, yeah. Uh -huh. And we used Paris Green, which was a lead arsenic in that time, wow. and a duster. So it was pretty primitive, but it did the job. They were potatoes they raised up there, yeah. So you're yeah. trying to always doing aviation as part of what you did. Yeah, I did in those days. I was young, yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Now the, the okay, now let's go airships. in the balloons. Now this is a British. We always think of the Germans, of course, as brilliant. And look how fast they moved. In other words, here we are in 1916, semi-rigid, as you can see here, mostly semi. And then you see they started to hang a car under here, and it kept, became more rigid. And then they kept doing And this is, goes along. They had water ballast and all these good things on it. But then look, and then finally they came down here. This was 1970. And look, just in a couple of years, this was actually a rigid deal. This was the R-34 with the separate engines and everything. Look at how they advanced. You can just see in the pictures. So it wasn't just Germans alone that they got all the credit. And of course, they carried it after the wars. But, uh, but Hindenburg, the British, after the Hindenburg, they didn't do this much. No, see, we did the Akron and the Macon, and that was done, of course, in Ohio. And, of course, they both got in thunderstorms and broke up, as you know. And uh, that ended that. Uh, but the Hindenburg was well after that. But that they had a very advanced design and so on. And they were fortunate in a way. They didn't have radar either, but they had good crews, and their only problem was they had hydrogen. They didn't have helium. So. You now, in, when the war started out, a lot of the, the ports, like Seattle, had like little air... Had little well, these were good, the blimps. Yeah. These blimps were really good. Now, they weren't rigid, and uh, but they were very dependable, and they had hangars like at Tillamacorg on Santa Ana, California, and so on. They were based there, and they were coastal patrol and uh, they carried some ash cans on them and so on. A few of them got knocked down, submarines that come up and boom, you know, but not many. And uh, they had the Civil Air Patrol flying airplanes out there too, and they may or may not, but mostly spotting. Because I'll tell you, in the early days of the war, my God, these submarines would come right up to the surface and torpedo ships right off the coast. I mean, it was really something else. You don't hear much of that. About that. No, but they did. In other words, as they said, you could see the fire line down that east coast where they were getting our shipping coming up the east coast. And then the balloons came in. The first they started coastal patrol with the CAP, and uh, they would they didn't like airplanes. They got out of the way. And then the blimps went out and they took it over. They did a good job. That, that was cut back. Did they also put up balloons like to protect airfields from being landed? Not in this country. They did over in Europe. In other words, they put balloons and hang cables and stuff like that. That was a, oh, that was from World War I, actually. They perfected that toward the end. But they did, they hung cables and all kinds of stuff. And uh, they had picket lines, they call them. And I don't know how effective they were. Maybe they snagged the German once they knew where they were. But that was not done. To my knowledge, it may have been. I don't think it was done in this country, but it was certainly done in England, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah.
And what's that white pillion right there behind you? Okay, this, this is Eddie Rickenbacker, and this is actually his signature and everything else. Pam has done all of this. She's gone out and tried to take and get authentic uh, pictures and uh, the signatures and so on. Did you yeah. ever meet him? Yes, I did. I met him. Oh, yes, yes. I didn't know him well. He's my dad's friend and uh, from World War, II, uh, World War I. But he was uh, president of Eastern Airlines. He took, took Eastern Airlines and he brought it up. Well, he turned over in his grave. He saw what they did with Eastern. That was pure management. But anyhow, this is his deal all the way through. And of course, he liked the spads and so on. Wasn't Frank Borman with Eastern at one time? Or? No, later on, but oh. yeah, yeah, not really with them, yeah. And then uh, here was this adversary right over here. Here's the Red Baron. This was his adversary. Uh, he was on the German side. This was the Red Baron. And boy, he was an ace. Only at the cost. He, he knocked down the British airplanes. Boy, did he ever. Uh, yeah. The Red Baron. The aces have respect for each other, don't they? Even yeah, they did. Well, you know, in World War, it was interesting because in World War I, my daddy always said that if an American got down was with the Germans, they were well treated, or vice versa. And uh, he had a fellow that uh, got knocked down and joined the Americans. So they didn't keep him as prisoners. They just kept him and so on back and forth. And the fellow had been in the shoe business over there and uh, in Germany. And, of course, that was all in it. He went in the service, too. And my da he and my dad became good friends. And after World War I, uh, he bought, actually bought last from my daddy and so on. So you never know, do you, all the way through. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So across the way you have a hangar with your own plane? Yeah, sure. I'll say everything's flyable that we have. Every airplane in here and all the way through, everything we keep flyable. Now this was the airplane. I soloed in one of, I think, three or four serial numbers different when he had the OX-5 engine in it. This was pro almost all restored by a fellow and his son. And they held his son, Daddy, I guess was 90 when they got it done. But anyway, everything was brand new on it. It had the OX-5 engine in it, and I got it from them, and I kind of finished things on it. But the OX-5 engine is impossible to get parts for it. And I had this engine, and what had happened, a UPF-7, which was a later training biplane, got hit by a gas truck on the back, and I picked up the engine and the prop for practically nothing from the insurance company. It was years ago. And I put it in the loft, and I forgot it. And then I got this. Jeez, I remembered that. So I got the engine down and sent it out and got it overhauled and so on in the propeller. And then I made an engine mount for an STC and put that in there. And imagine going from 90 horsepower to 220. That thing climbs out like a homesick angel. It's just tremendous. What's it about biplanes? Why do people like the biplanes? Well, I think romance more than anything else. It's just another wing to worry about, really. And of course, we learn more about airframe. Look at the camber on these wings, tremendous camber. And you got more speed and less drag, of course, out of the... And they were cheaper to build by a long ways. And your structure, of course, the biplane was easier to see with the triangulation and so on. And, uh, but we grew out of that, and uh, there were advantages and there were disadvantages, mostly drag. And you see all the camber in these wings, and of course, you were able to take and uh, control the wing. And the mostly, it was, was stress analysis. In other words, these were easy, relatively easy, let's put it that way, to stress with the triangulation. And you got a single wing airplane. In other words, getting the bottom coming up like Ryan did it out to the, from the gear down and so on. But that's the problem. How do you take a single? How do you do that? But you see now, they can pull both sides, you see, and lock that lower wing up. See, it's pulled out here and it's pulled up there, so it's it's in the middle. Then. A lot of people, even during World War II, trained on the biplane. Okay, right? let's show you what they trained on. We have a Stearman over here. And yeah, I interviewed a guy last week that, uh, okay. um, he's a P-38 pilot, but he trained on the Stearman. Okay, well, they mostly all did. This was a typical Stearman. Now, I modified it quite a bit, because most of these had a 300 horsepower engine in it, and I put a 450 horsepower engine in it, and an automatic propeller. And then also, I took and put a hatch on it, and uh, I wear tip-up glasses, and the wind buffeting isn't as good. So anyhow, I took an STC that, and also I put a spade down there to make the aileron so you can roll easier and so on with it. But this is probably one of the best stairmans you'll find. It's, everything's practically new in it. All of the, it was all new woodwork we did, and but the gear and everything on it is brand new. So, so this was what they, a lot of the World War II guys even trained on, right? You bet, probably the majority. They had the uh, PT-19, which was a Fairchild low wing, and that was next probably. And then they had the Ryan, which maybe 10 to 15 percent trained in, yeah. And then the, the Boeing bought out Stearman later, right? That was a Boeing Stearman. They made these all in Wichita. And somebody says, well, you call any a Boeing such and such, they expect to see a big airplane. And the guys do all that all the time. They come in with Stearman. 
Uh, we talked to one guy who uh, was de helped design that plane. His last name was Zip, or his grandfather was Zip. Okay. He said that if Stearman didn't get the name, it would have been a Zip plane. You know. It could have been. Now, the Stearman, of course, started well before World War II. And there's a lot of the original Stearman airmail, so and so on, flying. Not a lot of them, but number. Spokane, there's a group of them down there. They got a lot of these early airplanes, Stearmans. Yeah, you were talking about sometimes the mail, they would just drive down and just pick up the... Well, that was with the Stinson Reliant, and that was done back in Wilmington, Delaware. And what had, they had a contract, this would have been probably G39 or 40 somewhere. And they would take, and they'd have the mail and a loop, and you'd come right down and you'd pick it up and do it. You lost some airspeed, and then they'd drop off the mail they wanted to do that. And that was the government paid for that experiment. That went on for about two years and worked pretty well. It was their mail, they, but you didn't land, in other words. They had, and they had kind of a bungee cord, in other words, to pick it up. And it worked fairly well, yeah. Wilmington, Delaware, I think it was out of Wilmington, yeah. And then during the uh, Cold War and the Berlin airlift, they dropped a lot of stuff. They didn't pick stuff up, though. Well, most of it, uh, I was on that over there for a while. And uh, we flew stuff from England, of course, over there. And that was a regular train track and, uh, in and out of uh, the airport there. And we had C-47 to start with, and then we brought in the 54. We were bringing uh, coal in, everything there. Talk about dirty airplane. And that was a round-the-clock train going in there. And that's where we really learned to fly some lousy weather, too, into Temple Off. They just, that airport's not there anymore. They just wiped it out. And so on. But anyhow, we did that, and uh, we learned a lot on that. But uh, I think if Patton had been around, he'd have told him to go to hell. So. Now, my mom was uh, in the Air Force, and she was in the MATS. Oh, great. Military. Military Air Transport, you bet. Why did they but, go away from that? For well, they didn't, actually. That was the MATS were more Navy than uh, the Air Corps. But we all... Uh, we had called snafu, we call our airline situation normal, all fouled up, so, and that's what we called our. But the Mats, uh, they were pro, pretty much Navy, but we had Tunner, and uh, he ran our C-54s around the world and started Snowy Airlines and all these others. So, But Mats did a lot, and so, and so did Tunner with his group, yeah. yeah my mom was on the uh, Hungarian um, airlift, the people out of Hungary oh, during yeah. 54. Yeah. yeah. You bet. Military air transports bringing yeah. back. Well, Matt's, and of course, they're still uh, pretty active. They they were survivors, let's put it this way. Wow. And they they were active also in the Berlin airlift. But Tunner took over, and he really handled that. Wow. Yeah. Pretty neat. Do you want to see some of the other hangers? Yeah, let's, the, okay, let's see good. the other good stuff. Yeah. That's great.